Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Grayscale Gorilla Podcast. This is our first one in 2018. Uh, with us today is Chad Ashley. How are you, sir? Doing well. How are you? Oh, man. You know, I caught the bug. I caught the little sick bug uh, that was going around. I thought I escaped it after the holidays, and I told my brain, you did it. You skipped the 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 sick season, and then and then my brain uh, told me immediately, no, you're wrong, sucker. Dude, you and gotta I, wash your hands all the time. I've been doing the Constantly. hands. I've been doing, you know. So if I if I sound a little uh, a little nasally, extra nasally, I mean, I got the regular Midwest nasal going, but a little extra today. It's that that might be why. Uh, Chris Schmidt, how are you, sir? Happy New Year. What's going on? Happy New Year, man. How how was your uh, how was your New Year? It was, was good. It? it was relaxing. Just did some stuff around the house. Got to do some family things. Catch up on some uh, TV shows and some movies and some board games. It's fun. Yeah, I, I I like a nice relaxing New Year. The the part we could go party whenever you know. Let, let's let all the other people party. Um, <laughs> let's uh, man. I'm already listen, f uh, folks. This will be a fun one. I am on some serious Sudafed today, <clears throat> trying to get over this thing. And uh, let's uh, let's jump right into the podcast. We got uh, some follow up here. Um, let me click over. First of all. If you, uh, you know, it's, things have been a little bit quiet over at the at the blog, but things are picking back up now that the New Year's here. We have a ton of new tutorials that are coming out in the next couple of weeks. Stay tuned for that. Uh, we have a best of 2017 post um, where we went through and found all of our favorite podcast episodes, our favorite tutorials, our favorite interviews we've done over the year. And uh, so if you've been, you know, a little bit busy, wanted to catch up with some of the best stuff uh, from Grayscale Gorilla, definitely check that uh, post out. We're going to put it in the show notes. And if you're listening to this, it'll be in the show notes as well. So look for that. Uh, we have new tutorials coming soon. And um, yeah, any other follow-up from from uh, anything we've discussed in the past? Whoa. Uh, I'm working on week two with just my pen. Oh, you, that's right. Oh, so you whack em. are, are full, full hundred percent whack them now. Are yeah. you no mouse? No, I do have a mouse. It's, it's right off to the side, but, um, I've been trying, I've been really trying dude, but I gotta say, man, I don't know how you guys do it. Like I'm several times I've been like, I can't do this. I'm just going to throw this thing to the side and use it only for comping or whatever, but I'm really trying to give it a solid month, but it's been rough because I didn't. I've learned a lot. People have been really great. I hit up Twitter. I'm like, how the heck are you not? How the heck are you scrolling on websites? How the heck are you not accidentally clicking here or clicking there? And people have been really great about giving me tips uh, and like showing me little tricks to do. And so thank God I've, I solved the the scrolling thing. I figured that out. And uh, I'm still I'm getting better with clicking. But it's it's if you haven't used a, a Wacom pen for a number of years, like some of you guys have. I find that when I'm clicking on something, it's also a little bit of a drag. So I end up sort of dragging stuff. And then I've accidentally dragged folders into other folders. And I'm just like, oh my God, you know, like, am I going to get it? I'm starting to get the hang of it, but the jury's still still out. I'm not sure if it's going to be something I stick with, but I'm trying. I remember the drag where you, you try to like double click or click on something. And now it's like attached to your pen. There might be a setting yeah. for that as well. Um, yeah, there's so many settings and on Windows. It's even really jacked up too because then you got all the pen and ink shit and then you got like the ripples and all the stuff that you got to try to figure out. But I'm getting there. I'm getting yeah, there. Well, you and just so uh, everybody's caught up on the podcast, you started using Wacom uh, the same reason I did, which was your wrist started uh, like hurting, right? Yeah, I started to get like a, a weird it wasn't it was a pain, but like. A, fat a muscle fatigue that would result in my hand or parts of my hand like shaking. And it's not like, <laughs> you know, something serious or anything. It's muscle fatigue, but uh, it would it would hurt by the end of the day. And so I just needed to change it up, try something different. And I'm also a really tight gripper on the pen. So I'm trying to teach myself to not grip it so tightly so I don't end up with a different pain. But yeah, so I'm I'm trying it out. I'm, I, I don't know. What do you, are you like the person who puts the, the Wacom tablet in front of your keyboard or do you have it to the side? That's something that I've been back and forth on. I, um, I have a small Wacom and it's in front of my keyboard. Okay. So I you're the reach up. over. That's the thing. Like, dude, so give me a tip here. Um, 
I have it to the side and I've tried it in front of, but when I have it in front of the keyboard, I'm, I'm constantly putting my hands. And for those of you at home, I'm holding my pen in my hand while I'm trying to type and it ends up like touching the, the tablet and doing weird stuff. So I moved it to the side and then I've mm. heard people like, well, what's your method for typing? Do you put the pen down or do you leave it in your hand? I just did it and I do this. Yeah, you do that. I'm doing that too. And I'm just not good at it yet. Maybe that's what yeah, it might I, be. So it, I also kind of tick it over to the side. So it's not straight directly down below my keyboard. It's kind of over off to the right a little so that when the pen is in the, my little thumb area when I'm typing, it's mm -hmm. not really near anything like the erasers. The erasers kind of like on the edge or so over you're splitting the difference between the right and the middle. Yeah, it's definitely behind my key or it's definitely in front of my keyboard, but it's not like it, it, it's it's not centered on my keyboard. So I kind of have like my right hand goes right to it. But you know what? It took yeah. it took a long time. I had the same issue. I was, you know, using a mouse for 10 hours a day and had like the start of whatever wrist problems and not wrist, but like these tendons in your. Oh, yeah, that's more of a carpal tunnel thing, I think. And uh, just so happened, the artist that whose desk I was using had a small Wacom. So I plugged it in and forced myself to use it for like, um, yeah, probably at least two, three weeks, maybe a month before I got before I didn't feel like I was drunk clicking a mouse. <laughs> drunk clicking. Dude, yeah. I, I've already done a couple tutorials with it and I almost feel bad. I'm getting better, but I do kind of feel like. Eh, you know, and it feels fast because you got you just like immediately like go directly to where you want to go. Whereas with a mouse, sometimes you have to clap it down and like move it and whatnot. But I love I, that. I love I, that about Wacom where after a long time using it, I now know how to go up and like click in the upper right corner or in the lower left corner by muscle memory and not go click, drag, click, drag, like move yeah. your arm. I love that about Wacom. But, Is it Wacom or Wacom, dude? Because it's Wacom. Wacom. The company saying. itself says Wacom. Wacom. Yeah, we, we did the uh, we did the um, the the pilgrimage at NAB and said we're figuring this out once and for all. Let's go talk to the company, the people working there, and because uh, Wacom sounds so much more right, it sounds like I know. Fancy. I can't. I want to say that, but if they that. all say, you know, they say, they say, uh, um, Wacom, Wacom, Wacom. I Wacom. hardly knew. Wacom. Them. I was like, like Wacom. They're like, yeah. <laughs> Whack, 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 whack them all. That sounds so weird to me. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> all right. So that's just my little side. You oh, got wait, this. I've got, I've got one little announcement. Hit me. We've got Ask GSG coming back. Ask GSG what? is coming back this Wednesday. I say what? Yeah. So anybody who's not familiar with Ask GSG, uh, pretty much every Wednesday for a while, maybe the next half year or so, we're going to be doing a live show. On Wednesday, probably usually mostly me, and it's just two hours straight of people coming in, hanging out, asking questions, mostly about Cinema 4D, and we're gonna try and problem solve. We just uh, figure out specific questions. Maybe somebody's inspired by something specific. Maybe there's a motion graphics piece. Maybe there's a photo. Maybe there's just a, a cool Cinema 4D question. We try and figure it out live. So we're gonna be doing that. Uh, doing that starting Wednesday. I think it's always been at one o'clock central. I think I might shift it to two o'clock central. It's just a little more convenient. Awesome. Well, we'll have some details on the live page. Let's uh, why don't we fill up the live page with with those weeks as well, Chris, and that way people will know where to go. But if you go to grayscalegorilla.com slash live, we're going to update that schedule for Ask GSG. And um, we also have some announcements uh, for past seasons of Ask GSG. And a lot of you ask, you know, if you can watch the old seasons, we have those for sale on our site. And uh, we're, we're actually kind of consolidating them all to one bundle instead of selling each season separately. So keep a keep an eye open for that. And if um, you know, look look for um, look for some announcements about that soon. Hundreds of hours of Chris and me and Chad, mostly Chris, answering your questions. Um, Not only that, when you get the uh, when you buy the seasons, you get all of the scene files that get saved during the show. We include oh, yeah. all of those as well. So. You know, it's a crazy, it's crazy. And dude, we've got, it's like almost 300 hours of content right now. I mean, some of it's like three year or, you know, it's three or four years old now, but we're always adding awesome new things on top of it. Yeah. I should say too, I, I, I think this is true. Stop me if I, it's not true, Chad. It's all searchable now uh, in the back end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 
it, one of the things about the questions that that we get asked all the time, and like they're all over the place. So like how like how do you solve this problem with soft bodies, or how how would you go about modeling this type of thing? Or and Chris, like one of the best things working next to Chris is to be able to, and I've said this a lot, is to be able to like lean over, uh, you know next to my monitor and go, Hey, Chris, is this possible? Or how would you go about doing this? And having like somebody that knows cinema so much reach over and go like, yeah, that's possible. Or don't even bother. It's not possible. Or here's how I would approach it. And that's basically what SGSG is for everyone that's else. You know, it's great. It's um, like your little, yeah. your little moment. So what, what I was going to say was everything's searchable now. If you, uh, if you own or ever purchased any of the Ask GSG seasons, you'll be able to log in and search and be able to find, uh, questions based on maybe one of the problems you've been bumping into or if you always wanted to jump into soft body dynamics you can now go in and look for all the uh, questions that are that are about soft bodies so uh thanks to chad and and the team for getting all that Mostly good. thanks to Chris and taking good notes during his his sessions because without him writing down what was actually said we wouldn't even know <laughs> But thank God Chris is on top of that because otherwise there's so much content and there's so many sub questions and follow up and demonstrations of this and that, that you could learn something new in every like 15 minutes, probably. It's pretty fun to watch. If, if We're going to talk actually a little bit about this on today's uh, topic, but to watch how Chris's brain starts to break a project down. <laughs> is alone worth watching so that make sure you keep an eye out it's going to start this wednesday is that correct chris yep this this wednesday at two central uh and go to grayscalegrill.com slash live to learn more and um uh yeah come come get your questions answered ask gsg excited well hey let's uh dive into today's topic what do you guys think yes ready Ready. So Ready. the general mm -hmm. question, and, and I'll try to frame this as well as I can before the Sudafed really kicks in, uh, is the general question is like what to do when you get stuck. Um, and if we could specify it even more, and we talked a little bit about this before we hit record, but you know, when you're when you're trying to problem solve something or trying to make something happen in Cinema 4D in your job, and you're going down the road and all of a sudden everything stops. What you thought would what you thought worked, uh, or what you thought would work is not working, and so how do you break down the process of problem solving at that point? Because something you you can always do is try to go find your specific answer. You can go like maybe find a tutorial or find an Ask GSG where that specific question was answered, but that could get really dangerous sometimes if you if you're if you're finding something that isn't common or if you're if you're fundamentally just not sure why something isn't working so what what um you know we could talk about is how what's the process of getting unstuck and getting through a barrier where, where something is just not working you're banging your head against the wall what are the steps mentally and physically that you go through to get this stuff done does that does that uh, frame say, it okay yeah the first thing you should do is consume copious amounts of cough syrup <laughs> <laughs> and then just see where the day takes you just just what drug of choice and <laughs> then and then uh the client will just have to deal with it at that point yeah. like by the end of the day you won't care when you want to remember what, um, <laughs> what is this trippy thing this isn't this isn't my logo in lights you're like you're gonna like it listen i'm sick you get what you get <laughs> uh well you know i i can think of of uh of a ton of things, you know, like uh, uh, some of these are are built into some of our older tutorials where I'm learning Cinema 4D almost as I go in some of our early videos. And I think I know what I was doing, you know, and I'm going down the path and I'm all right. Now all we have to do is do this thing and I click it and it doesn't work. And I'm like, well, OK, well, let's problem solve it. And I try to walk through like the steps because I I think that just to set this up a little bit more, I think that it's a common fallacy that especially students and younger people that are getting into this they look at a final piece of work and they assume that that piece was just 
born into existence in a perfect harmony of the right buttons at the right time and putting this color exactly in the right place. And, and basically it just came out in, in a perfect world. And as we all know, and as anybody working in the industry knows, 90% of the job is problem solving and, and banging your head against the wall until you find the solution and dealing with how or figuring out how you deal with it and learning some of the skills to problem solve is as much a part of the job as learning a new tool or plugin or technique. Um, so let's, let's break it down. So you get a cup of coffee. Let's go with coffee instead of cough syrup. You get a cup of coffee, you come back and what's the first step you take when everything's just, nothing's working. Uh, who wants to go first? Well, why don't you start? Cause I'll get, get mine. Mine will get real technical. Well, I mean, so, okay. That's the scenario. Um, I, I usually will start if I hit a roadblock or if I, I come across something that's not doing what I think it should be doing. And I immediately will do one of two things. I'll either ask somebody that I think might know the answer. Or I was about to say, you ask me, and then... Yeah, I'll ask, like, I'm totally, yeah, that's... Because I worked with a, a, a guy, really smart guy, very technical guy, and he had this saying that was like... He, he said it so much, he made it like the signature of his email. And it said, uh, if you don't know, you better go ask somebody. Because more problems happen in production from someone making an assumption or doing something that they thought was right, but they weren't really sure what that could have been solved had they just go found somebody that knew the answer and just ask them really quickly. And if so, that's what I'll always do. I'll always say, hey, uh, this isn't working the way I thought it would. Uh, have you ever run into this? And if they say yes, and I get the answer and problem solved, and I go back to drinking coffee and working on my job. If I can't, if that person says, no, I've never seen that before, then that starts a whole other route of problem solving where I usually will try to figure out, number one, am I doing it the right way? So I'll go into whatever program I'm using and I'll open up the manual and I'll look up that section and I'll say, okay, I'm doing it. I'm following their steps. I'm just, I must be missing something. And I'll do the process of elimination, which I think all of us internally do, but maybe don't talk about it that much. And the, if you have a good process of elimination or you're, you're familiar with that, then you will uh, undoubtedly get more sleep and, and feel less nervous about deadlines if, you have a, if you're good at your process of elimination. Because if you, if you ever, okay, for instance, I have, a really, I have a really good story for this. I completely forgot about it until just now. Um, over the weekend, uh, somebody on our, on our GSG Connect Slack hit me up in a panic about something that they were rendering and they were rendering something up to uh, a cloud system and it came back with problems and problems and problems and they were panicking and i just happened to pick up my phone at that time and saw their message and i was like oh i'll help them out so the first thing i did is i was like well it was a particle thing they were sending up an x particles job to a cloud farm and I've been there. I've been. I've done this before, where I've had a problem with that. And the first qu question I asked was, "Did you cash out your particles?" And they're like, "Yes, I cashed them out. I cashed them out, and it's still not. It's returning weird things, and the particles go everywhere." And because of my experience, and I've done this a while, I was like, "Okay, well, you cash them out. So when you sent them up to the farm, did you cash them out to a separate file, or did you make them embedded in that scene file?" And they were like, "Oh yeah, okay." that I did not, I cashed them out to a separate file, but it must not have been uploading to the farm. So I'm like, okay, try that. And then they're like, yep, that was it. Thank you very much. You saved me a lot of time, but I had already, he's like, now I'm, I'm $700 into a render on the render farm trying to problem solve this out. And I said, well, here's another tip for you. Don't ever render out, uh, your, don't ever blindly render your full res, full scale animation on your first render. Like, always send up a tiny, crappy quality render up to the farm to make sure it's working, just to make sure textures are in the right place, everything's in the right place. And it's it, when you can, and I think a lot of artists that don't work in 
production studios with a bunch of teams and a bunch of people constantly doing this every day, you sometimes don't get that. And like, so you got to go through these, you're going to have to learn these $700 lessons to like really benefit. But anyway, that's, that was my little story that I was like, Oh, that actually kind of works for this podcast. Well, let's go through the steps. So I don't know what they did before they asked, but they asked, right. They asked right. The, the community at, at, and our, um, our Slack channel, if anybody had the problem, that's a great start, right? Whatever community you're plugged into, uh, your coworkers, Slack channel, um, you know, Twitter. <laughs> Has anyone come across this problem before? And, uh, and, and yeah, that's a great start. Generally, so, people are pretty, pretty good. I mean, people are generally helpful and they want to help if they have time to answer the question and they know the answer. That's generally a great resource. Well, then you also uh, said um, a process of elimination, which I've I, I've see, I see Chris do this a lot too. When whenever there's something uh, you know I have a problem with or a bug we're working through, he's really good at saying like, "All right, let's eliminate as many issues as we can." You know, turn off this, turn off this. So, Chris, what what's your what's your steps to go through this kind of stuff? Yeah, mine is very specific, and I'm also I'm whenever there's a technical question on our tech support, whenever anybody's sending tech support to Grayscale Gorilla, it, it almost inevitably gets to me because I'm the one who knows how all the plugins work and why we made those decisions and whatnot. So I'm dealing with this, you know, you know, maybe a dozen times a day where it's like, okay, let's isolate some problem and figure out specifically what it is. So the first step is isolating the problem. Let's, let's go with, uh, kind of Nick's proposed scenario. Let's assume you've got a big, fancy, complicated scene file. When you hit render, it crashes. You don't know why. Like you're just hitting render and you crash. You've got almost no information here. I hit render and I've got, who knows, like there's X particles and plugins and a bunch of stuff. And I, I also recently went from R18 to R19 and I'm trying to send to a render. For, there's so many variables you're dealing with. You cannot possibly try and figure that out just by blank checking things so immediately it is to isolate where the problem is so in this case let's you get your big complicated scene file you need to isolate what is causing the crash what plugin is breaking it maybe something in cinema maybe some combination you don't know what so what i would do is immediately you know save a copy of this file and delete half of the stuff out of the scene file delete a ton of stuff like literally half of everything that's that is executing get rid of it hit render did it crash or did it not crash if it crashes again, then what is still in the scene file is causing it. Now delete half of that stuff again, and you're going to keep on doing this process over and over and over again. Just keep deleting, deleting, isolating as much in the scene file as you can until it doesn't crash. And it's like, okay, then that means whatever you just deleted either is what's causing the crash or is part of what is causing the crash. And once again, just keep deleting. And I mean, and this often will get to the point where you, you know, have a sphere in a cloner in this plugin or maybe with this tag on there. And it's like, okay, something here is causing the crash. And if you can get it down to the tag that is causing it, then now you can troubleshoot. But until you get to that point, it's like, well, maybe, maybe something in X particles is freaking out or maybe it's running out of Ram or maybe like, there's so many questions you just can't even begin to answer it. So isolating the problem. And so, and to me, I think it is, I can't think of a faster way of doing it is literally delete half of everything. And once you delete half of everything, like, six times in a row, you have now isolated, isolated it down to, it's gotta be this, it's something here. So that is, that is number one figure of that out. And it, it, it can, it can be the kind of thing that might drive you crazy where, uh, has anybody ever sat behind like their mom or their grandma or somebody that doesn't know how to use the internet and they're trying to do something and you're just like, no, no, stop. No, don't do that. Uh, when somebody's trying to troubleshoot something and they've just got such a complicated scene and there's so many things going on and they're like, I don't know why it's breaking. It's like, well, let's figure out why it's breaking. That's, I mean, really is there after that's just guess and checking. If you have a hundred objects in your scene file, like that's a hundred objects that have how many potential interactions, like it's, it's almost an infinite problem. So that, that is absolutely the first step. And honestly, once you do that, like, and even that I, I would even, I would even argue that if you're going to do Chad's method, which is something that I can't really do very often, 
if, if you're on the topic of Cinema 4D, it's very rare for me to be able to go to somebody and say, hey, I've got this technical problem. How do I solve it? Because typically I'm the one solving the problem. But when it comes to other things, you know, I'll go to go to other people all the time. But how much more are they going to appreciate it if you're like, hey, the scene file isn't working and it keeps on crashing and I'm not going to send you a 200 meg scene file with a giant question mark of it's crashing. No, I've <laughs> isolated it down. And look, I've got three objects in my scene. And if you hit render right now, it'll probably crash. Can you help me now? Like you've already taken the load off and isolated these problems. So. I would even say before the step of, hey, can anybody solve this problem? If you don't have a very good idea of what is causing it, then then do that step. That's a that's a good way to help the person that you want to help you. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I definitely would never expect anybody to be able to solve a problem like that without doing some initial sort of process of elimination because it's a needle in a needle stack at that point. It could be anything. And I've had people ask me stuff like that too. And I'm just like, I just don't have enough information to go on to help you with this. Um, but usually if they kind of describe what they're doing, you can sort of point them in the right direction. Like, well, what are you doing? Well, I have uh, you know, a cloner that's going into this and then I have X particles and everything's being driven off of, you know, if, if they lay out the scenario, you can sometimes, and you're pretty good at this, Chris, like, smelling where the problem might be coming from well yeah at a certain point you've just used the software so dang much that you you're like well i've run into this problem a dozen times in different ways let's look in that direction and like you were just saying like you you've run into this next particles you have you now have experience with that um but i mean th that's that just goes to you need experience with these things to help troubleshoot or to have broad strokes like i know where to look even when i'm talking about the like you can go delete out half the scene file to isolate where the problem is. Well, if you're if you just recently added in uh, some third party plugin or you started using you just started using dynamics in the scene and now you're crashing, odds are it's something to do with those dynamics. So you can isolate even quicker to that. So I'll throw out there right now for anybody a quick tip: if you're doing anything with dynamics or particles or anything that requires a simulation, cache it out before you render. Because otherwise, if you throw it up to a cloud, all of that math that it has to do between, let's say, one blade starts picking up the job at frame 90, it has to hold or calculate, pre-calculate all that simulation data up until frame 90, which can either make it crash if the blade doesn't have enough RAM to be able to do that, or it just simply won't work. So when in doubt, cash it out. Or, or the worst possible scenario, you're getting... that's. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, cash it out. We need t-shirts, man. Yeah, you, that works better. I mean, the real one is uh, when in doubt, use a connect object, but yours rhymes. So <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say connect object. We, we, can't, we can't go... Hashtag trademark. <laughs> we can't go a, a problem-solving show without talking about the connect object because I know that's definitely isolating the issue, but I literally... For for not like a crash things, but when 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 something's just not working the way that I thought it would, or I'm like, okay, I put it in a cloner and I did this, and then I expect the dynamics to work this way, but they're totally doing something else. The number one thing that I definitely try and often works is just putting it in a connect object. And, and yep. We should we should make like a post that just shows like all the things that get solved when you put it in a connect object. Yeah, when you're clone, yeah, you're trying to like clone onto clones, and they're not working. Put in the connect object, like, well, yeah, like you said, dynamics. They're not working. Oh, connect object. Why isn't this thing beveling correctly? Put in the connect object. Like, it's just connect object is the ultimate thing. And the connect object, honestly, I think it it only does two things. Like behind the scenes, the code wise, what it's doing is it's kind of uh, parametrically making it editable. Anything that's kind of a a child of it, it becomes editable. And it's also a parametric optimize. So it's welding all the points together if you turn on the weld checkbox. And that's all it does. So essentially, it's the equivalent of make you have a cloner with a bunch of clones in it. You want to clone onto it? Well, a cloner can't clone onto a cloner, or sometimes it won't in certain conditions. But if you made that cloner editable, it would work. But instead of making it editable, you can put in a connect object. So it's a virtual make editable, which just solves almost all problems uh, it really does it just makes it it so what you're saying it like kind of fakes geometry like just plain geometry it to, returns to the, the final geometry is effectively what it's doing yeah that's that's a that's a huge help that thing that does really solve a lot of uh of issues
I didn't mean to uh, take you away. I just I no, wanna... no. I I can't believe that didn't pop in my head when we were talking about <laughs> problem solving. If you're in Cinema 4D, like Chad's method is good, like my method is good, but the real solution is using the connect object. And if that doesn't work, then cache it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I mean, we should just we label the the title of this episode. Just just put in a connect object. And we'll be good. We're good today. Yeah. Man, and the connect object only showed up a couple of years ago. Like we didn't have really? it for the longest time. Yeah. I always thought that was like part of the deal. Like that that would have to be in there from day one, you know? Because otherwise, how would you how would you do all that stuff? You would actually bake it down. You would actually make it editable and like connect and delete. Deesh. So Deesh. going down that road, not necessarily crashing, but let's say you're trying to work out a, like an idea or a concept and something you know uh I, I could give an example maybe but it might be more clear if we just kind of keep it generic you're going down the path you're you're trying to get this unique you know specific look happening or this specific animation style happening and you and you're pretty sure you know how it goes you go down the road or maybe you've even done it in the past or you watch the tutorial you go down it and all of a sudden it's just not doing what you thought it would do you know it's possible you know you're missing something but it's just not doing what you thought it would do. And that's a little tougher situation to be in because it, how do you, it's almost like proving a negative, you know, you know, something in here, like often there's a, there's a box that you need to tick in cinema 4d that allows you to, to do that thing. Um, I struggle a lot with this one where I, other than going back and rewatching the tutorial or finding a scene file where I've done it in the past or, or asking Chris, um, you know, I don't know the steps through that. Do you guys have a a, a process to go like, I know so this works. So you're saying, so you're saying the opposite scenario effectively, like instead of it, something not working, you're trying to get it to do something and you don't know how to make it do that thing. Yeah. But you, you think know, it can. Yeah. You think it can, or it's done it in the past. And we, we've done this on uh, a few ask GSGs too. You know, we're going down the path. We're like going to morph something from one thing to another. And we're like, we're both like we we know this works we've done it we're missing that checkbox we're missing that that one thing and we've i've got stuck like this a lot of times yeah along those lines a specific example that a lot of people can probably relate to if you're doing any kind of fancy mograph stuff at all it's like why isn't this working and then you realize you had render instances checked and we turn on render instances it makes mograph behave fundamentally differently like you cannot make clones have different colors like via certain effectors if instances is turned on so it's just like yeah you could do like uh, i think i can even remember some instances nick where you and i were doing the sgsg where it's like why is this cloner not behaving the way it should this is literally a process there's no mistake possible here and render instances was turned on right totally new behavior <laughs> that's another one we yep. need a t-shirt for render instances but that's a perfect <laughs> example and sometimes it's even more rare than that you're like well i don't do you know i don't do um like rope dynamics often or spline dynamics often, but w whenever I do, I always forget this one box, you know? I, I don't know if there's really an answer to this one other than just having that experience and knowing, you know, where to look and, and what to try to find. But I don't know you if you gotta save those scenes, man. You gotta have, like, that's what I do, dude. Like, I have a whole folder full of scenes that I'm like, oh, I know I'm gonna probably have to do this again someday. I'm gonna save this to my, I call it my C4D stuff scene that I name it as well as I can so that in the future I might know the name. So you know, if you search but, the computer for that potential yeah, problem. Exactly. So if I if I was doing let's say a rope or something and I got it behaving the way I want, I'll save it to that folder and call it like rope good or something like that. So that later on I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can just find that file and be like, oh yeah, that's what I did. And like that that has saved me so many times. Well, it's, it's offloading that part of your brain. Like you're not going to remember everything, but you did it one time. And so you've got your index file in your head. Like I know I've done like hair or rope or string. I did something along those lines. And if you, if you're treating yourself right in the future, then you can go and search that on your actual hard drive and then go find it. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten to the habit of like that folder is kind of gnarly. Like it's got a lot of stuff in it and to the point where it's like slow to, it's actually slow to uh, search it on windows, but it's on Dropbox. So it's synced to Dropbox. So I'll go to the Dropbox on, you know, the interface on their site. Cause that search is like really fast. 
and I'll just search for whatever it is that I'm trying to figure out. And I'll be like, oh yeah, that, I did make that. It's right here. And then I'll, then you can in the Dropbox uh, app online, you can say open in Explorer and it'll take you like right on your computer where it is. Yeah, that's cool. And another benefit, I have a very similar folder for me. It's underscore C4D and it's just full of stuff. It's got, it's got cascading folders inside of it. But the other great thing is like, if you're uh, stumped for like a cool idea or you're trying to think of a daily render or something, you just scroll through those uh, files and you're like, oh yeah, that thing, there's definitely something cool there and you can go explore it. So it's got a, a multi-purpose there. Yeah, but I encourage everybody to do that. The uh, so that's that's always fun. The uh, another thing I'd suggest, especially like in the example that uh, Nick and I were just talking about, where it's like, okay, you're trying to get a bunch of clones to get. Uh, it's even the kind of thing where it's like, okay, you make a big giant flat grid of clones, and you want to project a color based off of an image. That's like a process you do over and over again in Cinema 4D. And if you ever enter instances turn on, it just doesn't work. So. You might be working on a big, fancy, complicated file where it's like, oh, this is going to happen and they're going to dynamically follow and then these colors will all line up and then why won't they turn into this color? And you're trying and you're trying and trying. You don't know what the solution here is. What I would do is open up a new scene file and in isolation, as, as limited a scope as you can, create try and create the effect you're going for with as few variables as possible. Like, okay, make a cube make a cloner, make it look like it's got the colors. And because I'm starting it from scratch, I will not this time have turned on the render instances button. And now it works. It's like, oh, it's working this time. What's the difference between what I just did now and what I was doing in this more complicated file? And now you can actually go and target target the problem. So isolating, once again, isolate what you want to achieve and don't do it in a big complicated file with a million particles. Do it in a simple file with simple geometry and only a few particles. Get that working and now scale it up to the big project. Yeah, that that that's great advice. I, I definitely, I like doing that. And I think, I, I forget what you and I were working on together, but that was something that you were like, all right, let's just, let's just start this over and do it at a smaller scale. And I was like, oh yeah, that does make sense. Like why, why go through the troubleshooting process on some crazy scene where there's a billion variables when you can essentially do it with three objects and really get to the meat of what the problem might be. I think in some ways that's um, how a lot of our early tutorials were set up. Also, I, I guess I'll speak for for myself. That was kind of the the idea of Grayscale Gorilla when it started. Was like let's solve this with spheres and figure out this effect. Like let's make a sphere fall and do soft body, knowing that now that we know how to do this, it, it can now be in a more technical place. And in a lot of ways, that's that's really how I learn the best. And I expect or I suspect that there's a lot of people out there that learn better in that format where let's get rid of all the technical stuff. Let's get rid of all the high poly crazy stuff and let's go get the fundamental thing figured out. And then we could scale this up to a robot or a, a spaceship. But if we can make a sphere, you know, soft body, then we know the process. And then we can start to like make it more complicated as we go. But don't start with the with the complicated one if 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 you don't have the fundamental concept down yet. And maybe that's a way to think about it is like, okay, well, if you do want the big like here, here's like just a, a way to think about it. If you take a high poly robot and put soft body tag on it, you're done, right? Like soft like cinema crashes don't hit play yeah <laughs> don't hit play you're you're a goner and so the process of going okay well it works with a, a low poly object let's try a slightly more complicated one and learning that process to go through and go okay well how do you like it, it's almost a it's, a it's almost a way of learning is this problem solving process at least that's the way that my brain took it was like okay now i know how to make a sphere soft body let's make a slightly more complex object and let's work out the problems on a torus and let, let, then let's put the figure in there. Okay, well, now I put the, the human figure in here and now there's a whole bunch of other problems because it's a separate object. Now I got to learn about the, the um, connect object and make that soft body. And then I'm then, okay, well, if, if this is already slowing down my computer, how do I make something soft body that is like a giant, you know, high poly robot? Oh, okay, well, there's cages and I could deform the cage and the mesh and then the mesh will deform the high poly. Like there's these layers of learning that ultimately help problem solve uh, down the road because you can always come back to the, to the simple idea.
I don't mean yeah, it might be. Yeah, it's, it's like learning the learning a language. You know, you mm. can't you can't you know write a, a coherent thesis in another language before you learn how to say cat and dog. And it's I feel like three D is a language, and you are always learning it, always learning new styles of it when you're learning a new 3d program or new renderer or whatever and it's throughout it takes years to get to a, a place where uh senior levels in this in this business are where they've been doing it for so long that they just know what problems to look for they know that yeah if i'm going to put a soft body on a character i'm not going to do it on the high res mesh i'm going to do it on a cage but if you've never even done anything with soft bodies before how the hell would you even know what a cage was how would you even know like until you've like done the little stuff you 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 really are going to have a you'll be able to do it eventually the high the the big cage stuff you'll figure that out over time but it will have not come easy had you not done the the soft body on a sphere X well and even that uh, along those lines for problem solving a, a big way of self saving yourself a lot of time is even early on doing that prototyping every time i've gotten to do any kind of bigger project when i'm when i was working on some of those like movie title sequences like i gotta make the dumb and dumber logo all super squishy and bet dancing around it's like no open up a scene file make one letter get the geometry really clean and let's experiment let's see how far we can push this let's see what collapsing a letter down to zero space and exploding it back out again. How does that work? You don't make a giant file and you have all your letters laid out and say, okay, soft body go. It's like, no, no, like that's gonna take, like just think of how long it would take for that to bake. Like you're gonna bake that scene file. So I would go, right. okay, okay, it's gonna take 15 minutes for every time I wanna bake this. Or I can work on one letter and a bake takes 30 seconds. Like how many more times are you iterating with that very simple version of it? You get all the knowledge you need and now you go make the big giant real one. And yes, that will still take 15 minutes to bake, but you're going into it with so much more knowledge. Yeah, R&D time is, I used to build R&D time into the front end of every challenging job that I did uh, because and you know producers would get you know mad about it whatever like oh what's all this time for r d like do we, is, is what are we showing the client during that time nothing like we're not showing them anything this is for us to learn the best way to go about doing this job and that's a really crucial part of any production is like you said starting with something playing with it seeing how far you can push it r d is crucial crucial and I, I don't i can't i had to defend it so many times till after a, to, a couple times when we do something really cool or technically challenging only then did uh management producers and whatnot see the value of the r d because it, it was like we couldn't have done this had we not had two weeks to figure out this thing or this other program or whatever yeah that's oh, man that that is so the case. And I, I just picture, I haven't even, I don't even think I've really ended up in this kind of situation. But imagine you're doing some big, giant, complicated scene. You're like, okay, we have a very short time limit on which to do this. Let's brute force our way through it. Like, we just don't have any time. Like, let's go straight into the high poly, straight into a whole bunch of particles, straight into a whole bunch of dynamics, whatever the case. And it's like, okay, we brute forced our way through it. And we barely made the deadline. And then the client makes a change. And it's like, and now, now you have to, uh, you know, let's say it's a big, big fundamental change. Like you are going back to square one and brute forcing your way all the way back through it instead of starting simple, getting R&D. And then you can iterate, 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 and now make your big final version in so much less time, better control, better understanding. And hopefully during that process, you can give the client some simplified versions of things and be like, do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like stylistically? Like I'm saying, I don't need to see the entire I don't need to see 12 letters exploding and shrinking. Make one letter explode and shrink and be like, do you like the style? Do you like the speed? Like, oh, here's two letters, the way they bounce against each other. Do you like that? Okay, cool. Let's jump in and now make the full one. I had to look up this quote because it reminded me of it. Who knows? Who knows if all these quotes are apocryphal? These people aren't alive to really tell you if they said it or not. But let's just say that's true. Uh, it's, it's, uh, po uh like, I, I guess this is from Abraham Lincoln. Is it really? <clears throat> yeah. I was about yeah. to sarcastically say that he's going to say something from Abraham Lincoln. He's, he's like, he's going to say something about the connect object. I just know it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what Abraham Lincoln said was when in doubt, use a connect object. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew it. And, uh, he's not here to defend himself. So let's just uh, call that true. 
No, it says, uh, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. And it's something that stood out to me. And the first time I heard this kind of quote, it was more delivered in like a story form where one person just started cutting the tree down and the other person sat there, what looked like doing nothing for a while. And, um, when, when the person went up and asked them what they were doing, they said, well, I'm sharpening the ax. And this other person's got sweating and doing all this stuff. And of course, you know, th this story's played out a hundred ways and turtle and the hair and all this all the other kind of stuff. But something about that quote about sharpening your, your ax is kind of making me think about what you guys are talking about, talking about practicing, talking about R&D, talking about all the little things that you can do so that when it's time to deliver, when it's time to get the work done and the job done, that you don't get stuck. I think there's maybe a lesson in that too. When the client's paying and when things are on the line, that's not the time to get stuck. The time to get stuck is before and R&D and learning and practicing and on the weekends and you know experimenting with a, a new render style or whatever. That's the time to get stuck so that when the time is on the line or when the, when the client's on the line and the the deadlines in your face that you, that the, that it's more smooth sailing because you spent that time sharpening your axe or whatever so i don't know that that quote stood out to me as something that always makes me take a little break before i get started because that's my mentality too i just want to jump in get it going you know put the soft body to, chris has watched me do this a hundred times <laughs> put a you know just put a dynamics tag on it and see what breaks and uh that's my personality and it gets me in trouble a lot, you know, because it because now it's broken. And if I if I took a second and said, okay, let's get the fundamentals down, uh, that it could save some problems in the future. Uh, having said that, though, when we're developing products, Nick is great for doing some quick beta testing because I always use everything very kind of cleanly and logically. And I hand it to Nick, and he's you know using transform and changing objects while the timeline is playing, and and just is like, why are you doing that? He's like, I don't know, I'm just playing with it. It's like, well. <laughs> That's good because I can't make the assumption everybody's going to use it like clean and specifically like I am. I'm just going to throw a giant robot in transform while the timeline is playing. Yeah. Why are you Why are you putting a, a transform in a cloner, Nick? I'm like, I don't know. This is what I do. I'm trying to. I'm hopped it. up on cough syrup. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. Break it. Well, this, you know, we've discussed this in another podcast about learning how to break things. And, and this wasn't too long ago, maybe only a few podcasts ago. And I was talking about learning how to break stuff and learning how to get yourself into a sticky situation so that you know how to get out of it. And I think I even talked about like figuring out how to lock yourself in a room or get lost in a cave and having enough experience to know that you're going to get back out. And in a lot of ways, I think we're talking about a similar situation, which is having enough general knowledge about all the little bits and pieces of what you're working with to know when you get stuck where to start to look oh that's probably soft we, we've been talking a lot about dynamics right and 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 particle system like things that break a lot that are tedious that you have to know the the gotchas with so just getting yourself into that situation early on getting yourself into that situation before the clock's ticking is is, is super helpful as well that gives me an idea. We should we should do a contest where we make a scene file that just crashes like when you hit render and like send it out and the first person to solve solve it with a surprise. <laughs> that would be kind of fun to see like how fast people could solve it. I like it. That's, well, yeah, well, that's an interesting exercise. Well, boot camp. Hmm. Oh, I don't know why my brain's going to those things. Have you ever walked around a park <clears> and they have those like wooden exercise? things that nobody uses they're like a little pull-up bar and a little like uh you know a, a little bridge to walk across or like a balance beam am i am i am i i don't know if i've ever seen one in person but i think i know what you're talking about oh man i gotta stop making analogies when i'm on sudafed i'm gonna work this one out uh and then i'll, I'll bring it to you guys next week <laughs> man that's that's a good clip right there you can put that one out on youtube Watch Nick's brain go two circles. Well, um, you know, getting getting stuck. I'm trying to think of the last time that it, that isn't even necessarily Cinema 4D when I was just totally in a place and lost. Maybe here's a question: When do you know 
how do you know when to stop and approach it from a fundamentally different way? Because I know that I'm talking about the Roomba effect. The Roomba effect. Oh, this is good. I want to hear. That's what you're talking about right now, dude. All right. What What's the Roomba effect? I think. Haven't I talked? Haven't I given you guys the Roomba effect before? I think I've heard it before on another podcast, but you got to fill me in. So, the Roomba effect is. Y'all know what a Roomba is. It's one of those like Chris has one. It's one of those like little disc uh, robots that vacuum your house. Well, the problem it used to be, I think they're a lot better now, but back in the day when they first came out, they would just get stuck in a corner and just like bang their head into a corner all the time. And you'd have to walk over and pick them up and like redirect them. And when you're, you can, you can see when somebody has fallen victim to the Roomba effect. Mm. And, and they just can't get out of that corner. They just keep butting their heads against the same problem again and again and again until you physically have to go over to them and say, stop working on this. Go work on that and then come back to it. Or just stop working on it and give it to somebody else for a minute. Or go take a break. And you need to like pick up the Roomba and move it and then put it back down. And that happens to everybody. It happens to me. It happens to no, nobody is impervious to the Roomba effect. It's just, can you recognize, how quickly can you recognize that you're the Roomba? That's the key. You have to, you have to be uh, Roomba aware, like to say like, <laughs> I'm totally becoming a Roomba right now and I need to get up and get a coffee or put this away and come back to it, whatever. Or you have to have somebody working with you that says, hey, dude, you're Roombaing right now, and I got to, like, move you. That's, That's the pretty Roomba great. Thing. That's, That's the Roomba effect. effect. The, uh, along those lines, definitely another thing that I found is even the act of explaining something to another person. When, when, you, when you suddenly put yourself in the headspace where you're like, okay, uh, I'm stuck on something. I'm like, hey, Chad, I need help with this. Uh, I, I've got this, I'm trying to do this and I'm, I'm doing this. And as soon as it, as soon as I'm forced to view it from your point of view, cause I have to make you understand <laughs> what I'm doing. I love this. Then you're like, here's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying and I'm stuck in this corner. And as soon as you say that, it's like, wait, being stuck in this corner, isn't what I'm trying to do. Solving this earlier base problem is what I'm trying to do. So if I zoom out a level. And then approach it from a different direction. It's like, oh, never mind, Chad. Thanks. I got it. Like, thanks for being there to be a soundboard. You could even do that via an email or even probably messaging on Slack or something where you're like typing out the problem. And then the process of zooming out a level to explain to someone else, here's what the problem is. You suddenly think about it in a different way. And now you now you've solved it yourself. It, there was I I we used to um uh, at the office at uh, where I used to work, there would be like uh, I was the person that I was the Chris. I was the guy that somebody would be like, Hey, how do I do this? And almost nine times out of 10, I would just walk over to their desk and they would explain the problem. And it would either trigger, like you said, something in their head that would be like, Oh yeah, I, I got it. Never mind. I, I know what I did. And it, it would it would get to the point where like, I didn't even want to get out, out of my desk because I knew <laughs> it would be solved by the time I got up and went over there to listen. And it, it yeah, that happens so much. And, and just by vocalizing the problem, which goes back to me selling, ask somebody, you are forced to, like you said, I totally see that, man. Like that is so spot on because you just, you just, it clicks in your head and you're like, oh, this one thing, shit. I forgot. Yeah, that's so perfect. And then as the person, here's a tip. If you're the person that they're asking, pretend like you solve their problem and be like, I got the Midas touch. And <laughs> you're, just, welcome. you're welcome. And just walk around like you, you, you know everything. I mean, that's like a trope in sitcoms still. It's like somebody walks in the room angry about something and they they like go through their whole day like this happened and this, I can't believe. And then by the end of it, they're like, oh, and I figured it out. And then they leave the room. They're like, thanks for helping. And the other person said nothing, right? It's like, <laughs> you're a genius. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and then all you have to do is be like, anytime. Anytime. When in doubt, as Abraham Lincoln said, <laughs> when, <laughs> go sharpen your connect object. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing um, a lot of, you know, asking and having this community and, and I can't stress it enough. Um, as we start to wrap up here, 
having that community, building that community and, and having someone to reach out to, uh, because I know a, a lot of people listening are working, uh, they're the only 3D person or, or motion graphics person at, at the office. Building that online community early in your career and having people to reach out to. And I should say, having someone that you've helped in the past from your side that you can also, like they can return the favor is also something that you need to set up early on. It's really hard to reach out and say, hey, help me with this to somebody that doesn't know you or barely knows you or is just on a forum and, and you, like you just signed up to a ask this question. One of the best things you could do, and this is for all parts of your career, I'm still convinced of this, is to have that community early on. People that you, and, and, and here's the punchline, the best way to find this community if you don't have one is to go out and start helping people right now. And this is really extra true if you have more time on your hands, if you're younger, if you're, if you're hungry for this stuff, you go out and you uh, help other people as much as you can so that when you have a question, you can come into the same community and do the same thing. Um, I'm not explaining it as clearly as I, as I hope to, but at the end of so many of these podcasts, it all comes back down to people and who you can reach out to and who you can ask a question to. And, um, I, I think I bring it up more and more because so many of us love being by ourselves <laughs> and being behind the computer. And at, at least I'll speak for myself. It could be hard to get, to build a community around this stuff and to have people to reach out to, um, especially early, early in my career. But one of the best ways that I did that was to go out and help people with the things that I did know about. So when people had a question about at that time, you know, what, computer to buy or about After Effects keyframing, which I knew a lot about, I would go help all those people. I would just answer questions on forums and, and, and today it would be a Slack channel, knowing that when I had an issue, I could come to the same group and ask them. And so I guess I'm just describing a community. Um, but for those of you out there that are like, how do I, how do I join this community? How do, I, uh, how do I become a part of it? Well, you don't become a part of a community by just showing up and asking. You become a part of a community by helping and and volunteering and 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 uh, being a part, right? You have to be do your part as well. Um, so I don't know. I, it, it's just it's something that it dawned on me. It took a long time for me to figure that out. That it is about people. Um, so if you're out there and you don't have that, go to the meetups. You know, <laughs> that's the same thing at the end of all the podcasts. Go to the meetups. Join the slacks. If you have ever been, uh, if you ever purchased anything from Grayscale Gorilla, come join our um, GSG Connect Slack. There's so many questions being answered in this thing by people uh, asking about hardware and software and renders. And I mean, every time zone. There. Yeah, it's going on all day. So yeah. um, uh, come join us uh, and, you know, just be a part, be a part of whatever community you're in right now to, um, to, to have that, to have that. Uh, man. I don't think I need more coffee or Sudafed. That's really. Do I sound like a downer? I feel like a, I lost my I lost my sparkle today. No, I, you're doing pretty well. well. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we should wrap this up before I start crying or something. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> more Sudafed. More Sudafed. <laughs> oh man. Uh, anything? Uh, anything? Just to 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 close up this uh, concept of getting stuck. Any last uh, minute advice? For anyone out there that's stuck right now on a project. No, that's, I think we covered it pretty well. Other than asking, I'll have one more and we'll close out. Step away. Step away. Don't be the Roomba. Sometimes if you don't have someone that works with you that's telling you that you're a Roomba and you need to step away, the best thing that you could do for yourself sometimes is walk away from a problem. And I know for me and many others out there, Walking away from a problem, taking a walk, doing good, getting some exercise, having a conversation about it, mixes up our brain just enough to allow us to come back with a fresh perspective. Like Chris was saying, just describing the problem to other people. But again, just walking away from a problem and coming back to it later will often get you in a different frame of mind to approach it in a different way. So, if totally. How, how many times have you uh, 
walked away from a problem and then the next morning in the during your shower you're like i got it i know exactly what the problem is like showers are for solving problems yeah yeah sleep like all the all the synapses while you're sleeping are are like worried about that problem all night and trying to figure it out in the shower it like it just appears you know so step away take a break um and and uh, ask others i think um those are those are two good starts uh, as always, thank you for listening to the Grace Gorilla podcast. Uh, before you take off, if you have any um, topics or ideas uh, that you'd like us to discuss in future episodes, please put them in the comments. We're always looking at those for topic ideas. Um, and, you know, as far as being a part of the conversation, come join us where we're, we have, uh, you know, all these uh, comments on YouTube that pop up on all the um, episodes and on our tutorials as well. Come in, solve someone's problem. Uh, and, and if you have a problem, ask it, there might be someone out there, um, with the same problem that they've, they've had in the past. So anyway, thank you again for listening. Uh, as always check out the show notes and, uh, we will see you in another Grayscale Gorilla podcast really soon. Thanks for, uh, joining, joining us, uh, to, to all of you listening and thank you to you guys as well for coming on and talking about this. Bye-bye. Bye everybody. More Sudafed.